Intel's X79 platform has long held a loving position in the hearts and minds of many reviewers and those of us who've been around long enough to remember what it was capable of. But with AMD and Intel now engaged in another round of the core wars, even modern mainstream processors have the same or better configurations than the venerable i7-3930K. With that being said, can the older platform and processor still hang with today's competition? Ready to dive into custom water cooling but unclear about what parts you might need? Check out Thermaltake's new M360 Plus RGB kit. Featuring a D5 pump res combo, 16mm hard tube, Pacific C Pro fittings, and the best RGB implementation on the market, the M360 Plus fits all mainstream Intel and AMD sockets and is fully expandable as your system evolves. Check out the link in the video description to learn more. So this is the i7-3930K. It's part of the Sandy Bridge generation of parts that came out in 2011, and it uses the same 32 nanometer manufacturing process that produced the legendary 2600K and 2700K. It's not the highest skew in the Sandy Bridge E lineup, that distinction belongs to the 3960X. But unlike today's Extreme Edition processors, the 3960X actually used the same core count and thread configuration as the 3930K, meaning that the performance difference between the two is actually pretty minimal. Ironically, even though the LGA 2011 socket was in fact introduced in 2011, that's not where it got its name from. Like all other Intel LGA sockets, it's named for the number of contact pins, but the name itself does incidentally help us remember just how old this technology is getting. As of the filming of this video, it's quickly approaching seven years. And in computer terms, that's positively ancient. Still though, up until October of last year, 2017, you just could not buy a mainstream Intel part that sported the same six cores and 12 threads. They simply didn't exist. Of course, the HEDT lineup continued to feature chips with the same or higher core counts, but the cost of diving into X99 or X299 was and still is fairly high. If you were still chugging along with an older X79 CPU, like the 3930K, you were probably pretty happy to continue to do so. But as progress progressed, of course we finally got six cores on the desktop in the form of an i7-8700K. A fantastic gaming processor, its higher core count meant that it was also pretty good at other tasks as well. So what I wanted to do in this video is take the 3930K with its old school cool and compare it to similarly configured modern hardware in the LGA 1151 socket and the 8700K. I knew going in that the 3930K was at a disadvantage, but that didn't necessarily mean that it's not going to at least give us serviceable results. However, I quickly ran into my first roadblock, motherboard availability. The chip itself is actually pretty easy to source. You could still find them new for $130 to $140. And if you want to go to the used route, there are plenty on eBay for $80 to $100 from reputable sellers. But motherboards have a significantly shorter lifespan than do processors. And as time has passed and boards have failed or been upgraded and disposed of or stored in an attic somewhere and forgotten about, the supply of name brand products has dwindled and prices have skyrocketed. Because the Sandy Bridge E chips still have a good amount of utility and are more than usable in many scenarios, system builders searching for a home for their 3930Ks have fewer and fewer choices. I reached out to some of my vendor contacts to try to source a board, but only one company still had one kicking around the office, and it was an engineering sample that they needed to keep in-house. I wasn't about to spend $400 on a motherboard that I'd likely be using only for this video, so I looked into other options. The Chinese market must have realized that there is still significant demand for X79 boards, so now you can buy new, unbranded, usually really ugly ones on eBay and even on Amazon for under a hundred bucks. And that's what I have here. It's a weird in-between size, not quite micro ATX, but definitely not full ATX. It's got baby blue dim slots with a poop brown PCB and heat sinks that were probably sourced off of an old VCR or something, but it's 100% functional, runs quad channel memory, and I actually had zero compatibility issues. Of course, 
there is no BIOS access, so overclocking was unfortunately out of the question. But at this point, I think overall, people who wanna stick with X79 are doing so for purely functional reasons, not necessarily because they wanna tinker with the base clock. One of the best parts about Intel's modern socket designs is that they haven't gone and monkeyed with the cooler mounting dimensions in quite a long time. And all modern CPU coolers should still fit onto these older sockets. Because I wasn't able to overclock, I simply mounted up a decent air cooler, the CryoRig H7 Quad Lumi, and started running some productivity benchmarks. I ran the same set of tests on both the 3930K and the 8700K, focused around the task that I think a lot of people still using a processor like this are likely doing, and that's video editing. For both systems, I used 16 gigs of RAM, although with the 8700K, I used a two by eight gig kit, whereas with the 3930K, I used a four by four gig kit of DDR3. Both builds used the GTX 1080 Founders Edition at stock settings. The 8700K was also left stock and the memory was not overclocked. MCU was turned off. Of course, what would a CPU comparison test be without Cinebench? And even though both processors have the same six cores and 12 threads, we can already see that not all cores are created equal. In fact, in single core performance, the 3930K scores 131, while the 8700K rocks out at 193. This will be relevant later when we do some gaming benchmarks. The next three slides will show actual programs that are relevant to the workflow of many creative professionals. Adobe Premiere exporting was first up and it's honestly kind of a slaughter. If you have one project to render, you might say, eh, what's a couple of extra minutes? But if this is what you do for a living, five minutes a day times five days a week times 52 weeks in a year is 1300 minutes or 21.67 hours. Not to mention that timeline scrubbing with the 3930K was pretty rough with 4K footage. Moving on to Blender and Handbrake, we see really similar results. Functional? Yes, absolutely. If this is your only option, then you can definitely get by. But as files continue to get larger, video file resolutions get higher, and edits, renders, and transcodes get more complicated, the disparity will only increase. Here's a comparison chart showing the percent improvement from X79 to Z370, which before I started testing, I honestly didn't think would show this big of a spread. Now, I won't pretend to believe that I was extracting maximum performance out of my 3930K from my cheapo no-name motherboard. I guarantee that sticking this thing in an EVGA X79 classified would give me better results. But I think the gap is just too wide to make up any serious and significant ground, and it's pretty clear that the 3930K is at a real disadvantage in almost every task. Of course, I couldn't just end the video here though. What about gaming? The 8700K is the king of gaming CPUs currently, and the HEDT platform was never known for its gaming acumen to begin with. As we noted before, the 3930K also has a big deficit when it comes to single core performance. But if you have one of these set up in your system at home, it's likely that you still like to load up a game every now and then and kill some time. So even though I knew it again wouldn't go so well, I fired up four different modern titles and saw how they performed. The 3930K system ran fairly consistently between 20 and 25% slower than the 8700K system at 1080p and created a moderate bottleneck for our GTX 1080, even though the games were still very playable. I also did notice some stuttering and sudden frame rate dips. And even though I wasn't measuring 1% lows here as this video isn't focused on gaming performance, it was clear that the 3930K wasn't really designed for AAA gaming in 2018. So here's the conclusion. When we look at the 3930K in a vacuum, it's still a very serviceable processor. It can still export videos in Premiere without any issues. It can still render a scene in Blender or transcode some footage in Handbrake. It can even mostly keep up with a GTX 1080 and provide you with a pretty good gaming experience. But when we take other factors into consideration, especially the availability of something like the 8700K, X79 starts to feel 
less appealing. The 3930K was not in the same ballpark when it comes to gaming or productivity performance. It uses a slower, outdated memory standard. Replacement parts are impossible to find unless you want to pay an arm and a leg. And if you want features like an M.2 slot or USB-C, well, good luck. I understand that nobody right now is going out and buying a new X79 based system. That's silly. But as an exercise, I thought about what it might cost to do so. The 3930K is, I guess let's call it $100. A good motherboard, even used, is gonna cost you close to 400. Plus DDR4 memory prices are about the same as DDR3, so that's kind of a wash. An 8700K is $350, and you can get a good mid-range board for $150 all day. That's $500, the same as the X79 build. Some choices just aren't as hard as some others. So I hope you enjoyed my little look back at a platform that's still surprisingly relevant. Leave a comment down below if you have memories of using an X79 processor, or if you still use one today. Also, don't forget to get subscribed to the channel if you are not already. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.